Hello, everyone. Can you hear me well? OK, great. Um, so it's a pleasure to be here. Thank you for the invitation. Um, I will be giving a perspective on standardization of advanced cryptography at NIST. And as the title indicates, it's not the perspective. It's one perspective. I've been for two years at NIST. So in one sense, this may be a limited perspective because I don't know the full history of NIST. But I also believe it's a fresh perspective uh, with respect to things that are uh, whose time has arrived now, namely advanced cryptography with respect to standardization. Uh, OK, here we go. Uh, since I'll be giving a perspective about NIST, I want to start with an introduction uh, about NIST, and I'll be spending a little bit of time kind of explaining how the crypto group uh, uh, fits within the NIST organization, the kinds of standards that it does, and kinds of activities that we do. Uh, then I'll focus the main part of the presentation in giving an update on uh, threshold cryptography, which is one of our um, current projects that arguably can be called advanced cryptography. And then I'll try to extract some considerations about the standardization process. Um, then I'll give a very brief uh, uh, note on privacy enhancing cryptography because time doesn't allow much more. And then I'll conclude with hopefully some interesting remarks. OK, so uh, NIST has been around since uh, 1901. So it is, uh, it's been around for more than 100 years, uh, previously known as the National Bureau of Standards. Uh, it's a non-regulatory federal agency with respect to standards. And what that means is that we don't regulate how the standards are going to be used. So for, for the most part and for many stakeholders, standards are voluntary. Uh, there may be other agencies that then mandate that some standards be used in some situations. Um, the mission statement has a, a number of keywords, innovation, competitiveness. We do measurement science, standards and technology. And we do these things when we try to enhance economic security and improve our quality of life. So if you think of things like, for example, privacy, does privacy improve quality of life? Do, may it uh, enhance economic security? If yes, then possibly privacy is one uh, uh, would fit in this uh, mission. So this is a, a, an image of um, the NIST campus. It's about 1.5 miles, just for an idea of perspective. We have about between 6,000 and 7,000 uh, persons working. Uh, there are two campuses in, in the US. And uh, there's a wide range of competencies, uh, which is divided in, in labs. So we have physics, uh, measurement science, uh, communication, uh, um, and information technologies. That's where cryptography fits. And then organiz organizationally, we have these labs. We're divided into divisions. And then divisions are divided into groups. And then each group has a bunch of projects. And essentially, what we do is standards, research, and applications about these subjects. OK, so the crypto group is within the Information Technology Lab, um, which basically deals with technology, mathematics, and uh, statistics. This is a little slower than I had in mind. OK. Um, and then we are within the Computer Security Division that works with a number of things related to security, including cryptographic technology, but also software uh, security, uh, risk management, and security engineering. And in particular, for example, also testing and validation, which uh, in some occasions works closely with crypto with respect to evaluating uh, cryptographic algorithms and cryptographic uh, modules. And then finally, we have the cryptographic technology group, where again, we have a number of keywords, research, develop, engineer, and produce guidelines, recommendations, and best practices. And within the scope of this presentation, this is what I will broadly call standards. Um, OK. The kind of documents that we produce um, basically fit into three categories. Uh, FIPS, which are Federal uh, Information Processing Standards. This is what more formally are called standards. They need to be vetted by the Department of Commerce. Then we have uh, also uh, a special publications in computer security, which does recommendations, guidelines, and reference material, which again, I will be called broadly as standards in this case. And then we also have NIST IRs, which are basically internal reports or interagency reports. Internal from the point of view that they're done internally, but they're all made public. And they contain uh, research reports and background information, namely about our initiatives, such as uh, uh, standardization of uh, uh, advanced cryptography and other, other fields. And 
very broadly, we interact, uh, we have an international interaction uh, involving several sectors, government, industry, academia, and other standardization bodies. Okay, so this is kind of uh, a very quick overview, and just to have a glimpse of, uh, of dimension. So here's NIST with about six to 7,000 uh, persons, workers. Then we have uh, Information Technology Group, 700 and something. Computer Security, 150. And then Cryptographic Technology, 30 something persons. Uh, I think one, one uh, good reason to show this is to show that uh, resources are not infinite. So there's a finite uh, amount of resources, and basically we have 30 something persons working in a number of uh, cryptographic uh, programs at NIST. Some of these you may have heard about, for example, post-quantum and lightweight cryptography, they're currently ongoing. Uh, privacy enhancing technology and threshold cryptography, that's what I'll be talking about today. And then we have other programs like, for example, the Randomness Beacon, which is basically an application where we promote uh, uh, public randomness as a, as a public utility, also some applications to privacy. And then we also do, for example, uh, uh, basic research in circuit complexity, and we have a number of other uh, programs. Okay, so now for the actual standards. Traditionally, NIST has focused on um, what we may call basic primitives, at least in contrast with what we want to call here uh, advanced cryptography. Um, and basic primitives basically fit into these things like block ciphers, when you want to encipher something, cipher modes, when you want to encrypt uh, arbitrary large string, hash functions, signatures. Interestingly, we don't have here public key uh, cryptography, but it's within pairwise key agreement that we actually standardize, for example, RSA. And then we have uh, digital, uh, sorry, d deterministic random bit generators. There's a bunch of items that we standardize here, and it would actually be a somewhat interesting talk to talk about some of this, but that's not gonna be what I'm gonna be talking about. I just wanna highlight a few uh, interesting points to show some diversity of, uh, of possibilities. So for example, AES, Advanced Encryption Standard, and uh, SHA-3, so Secure Hash Algorithm version three, were both developed within uh, international, comp what we call competitions. So this was a very open and transparent process. I think it's fair to say that they are very successful standards from the point of view of the trust uh, and their trustworthiness. Uh, but not all, not all uh, algorithms have been devised in such a manner. Maybe in the other, extreme, we would have cases maybe less known, for example, EES, which would stands for Escrowed uh, Encryption Standard, uh, was something in the 1994 that was basically NIST got a presidential directive saying that the NIST had a, a certain amount of months to, to publish this standard. And this was a standard that basically referred to a confidential primitive, a, a classified primitive. So we actually had a standard where some of the operations that were going to be executed were not publicly known. And this was a, a scheme that had a law enforcement field that basically intended to allow uh, law enforcement under certain circumstances to decrypt uh, tech, uh, plain text that had been encrypted. Uh, also, a different use case, we have the dual uh, EC DRBG, which is a, a, um, was a method uh, of deterministic random bit generators that in 2015 was uh, withdrawn due to concerns of potential subversion. This talk is not about these things, I ju I'm just pointing out these things to show different ways in which uh, different standards were developed. Okay, then we have uh, also, interestingly, uh, the case of RSA public key encryption that at least within NIST is, is uh, standardized as one of the tools that allows pairwise key agreement, although we don't have public key encryption, just the standard itself, although we have it for, for digital signatures. So it's another way in which something can be standardized as a tool that is, that is uh, enabling some other thing to, to happen. And just as another example uh, of something that may happen, this year, very soon, we will have uh, Edward's uh, digital signature algorithm, which is basically a variant of uh, Schnorr uh, algorithm standardized. And the reason why I put it here and that I find it interesting is that this was actually in consideration in the 90s when DSA was uh, selected. And the reason, one of the, the weighing factors at least uh, that weighed on this not being selected at the time was that there were patent concerns uh, because the algorithm was patented. So it's, for example, one consideration to have 
with respect to standardization. Okay, so this is a uh, general overview. Some of these standards were uh, specified by reference to other standards, so other standards already existed. And there are basically many methods through which these things can appear, either by internal development or interagency development, uh, either by adoption of external standards that already exist, or by open calls, competition, or what we now could call competition-like uh, 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 procedures, which are not necessarily exactly competition, because maybe NIST reserves the right to, to make some, some tweaks uh, in the end. Okay, so just to give also a glimpse of other processes not mentioned there, as I mentioned, the post-quantum and the lightweight cryptography are ongoing processes that intend to standardize uh, uh, primitives that have certain properties, like resilience against uh, public, uh, quantum computation and are suitable, for example, for IoT in the case of lightweight cryptography. We also have cases where, I'm sorry, where should I put to point this? It would be this way, okay. Um, we also have cases, for example, like uh, pairing-based cryptography, where uh, NIST considered the interest of potentially standardizing it. In 2008, it had a, a workshop. Uh, then it had a study and call for feedback. He made a report about it, basing for, basically forming its position. And the position is, this is very interesting, but more research is needed. And since then, uh, nothing else has been done, but it's something that can potentially still be, become uh, a standard at some point. Okay, final point about still NIST standardization. After the, the concerns around the dual EC, the RBG, uh, NIST revised uh, and formalized some principles related to the development process of crypto standards. And so we have this uh, NIST IR, which I would recommend as a reading. It's, it's fairly short, but it's very interesting, uh, which is basically crypt uh, NIST cryptographic standards and guideline development uh, process. Basically, we formalize a number, formalize a number of uh, principles, transparency, openness, integrity, etc. And this is the thing that we need to abide by as we do new standards and as we follow new standardization processes. Okay, so this was quite an introduction for NIST in terms of time. Okay, threshold cryptography. This is one of our ongoing uh, projects. The goal is to standardize threshold schemes for cryptographic primitives. Uh, cryptographic primitives may include uh, uh, signatures, public key decryption, key generation and ciphering, basically everything that involves a key. Can also extend to things that don't involve keys. Uh, the, basically what we want is to enable distributed computation of these primitives in a way that each component operates only on a share of the key. So no component knows the exact secret key. And basically then we have uh, properties like tolerance to a number of faults, F out of N faults. And then we have interesting properties also like enhanced resistance against side channel attacks. Um, this project raises a number of questions. Potentially we, we may have many standards just imagine several standards for each of the existing standards. So which, which ones are we going to standardize? What kind of standards are we gonna have? What processes will we follow for this? Will we, in some cases, will NIST just come up with a direct proposal and ask feedback to the community, do you agree with this? Or will we actually make an open call and receive any kind of uh, uh, protocol that can come? Or will we just look, look around and adopt uh, standards from other organizations? Uh, and then it's also being a very, very broad in scope. It involves several areas of expertise. So one of the questions we ask is, how can we involve uh, all the stakeholders basically to maximize the human resources that we have available for this? Okay, I'll talk a little bit about this um, project, uh, the things we've done so far. So we've done a, 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 a NIST IR, a report on threshold schemes, draft in July. We opened for public comments for three months. We finalized it in March 2019. Uh, um, also in March 2019, we had um, a workshop open to, to, any, to everyone. Uh, we had about 80 attendees. And uh, this is what we've done so far. And now what we're doing is we're drafting a roadmap towards standardization. And immediately after that, we'll hopefully, well, we hope to get some good feedback. Uh, about the roadmap and specifically about items for standardization and criteria for possible calls for contribution, where calls for contribution here can mean several possible things. Okay, uh, why bothering starting with these uh, two initial steps? Why don't we just put the standards out? Um, well, 
first off, there are steps in this uh, driving an open and transparent process. It's part of one of those uh, principles that I mentioned before. And also because the actual reflection that we do along the way uh, and the learning process that we get is actually quite useful to determine what we'll get. Um, a few notes on some insights. So for example, when we did the workshop, uh, basically we realized we can't just talk about threshold schemes and say, yeah, threshold schemes are better than than uh, usual primitives, so one out of one. Uh, it depends on a lot of things, and so for example, we defined kind of a little framework basically saying, okay, whenever we wanna talk about threshold schemes, we need to identify a number of features. What are the kinds of thresholds? What, uh, what are the thresholds for each possible property that we may wanna talk about? What are the communication interfaces with respect to client that asks something for the module? Because we can have very different schemes, some where the client doesn't know that he's talking with a threshold scheme, others where the client actually wants to share his input and then send different shares as a way, for example, of preserving privacy of his own input. What are the executing platforms? Are we talking about hardware or software? Or more importantly, are we talking about a single device that within it has a threshold circuit de design? Or are we talking about multi-parties? And then we actually have basically secure multi-party computation. And then setup and maintenance, which essentially covers uh, trusted assumptions. And then things like, uh, are we able to rejuvenate components when they get uh, uh, compromised? Then there's a number of other uh, items. Dilemmas about granularity. Where should we standardize? Should we standardize the building blocks and then move up, or should we just go immediately for the, for the actual uh, protocols that we want to standardize? Uh, we've got some feedback in terms of uh, being useful to separate very clearly the single device from the multi-party scenario because they are substantially different. Um, we've got feedback about the usefulness of explaining rationale, namely as we did in the report. And we take that as a motivation to do it in the upcoming uh, process. Uh, and we also notice strong willingness from the stakeholders to contribute. So we are hoping that indeed we're going to have uh, collaboration along this process. Um, and we're encouraged to move forward. OK, so how about this roadmap that we are writing? Well, basically, what we want is we want to get a map. We want to decide in which places of the map we want to go. And we want to know how to get uh, there. Uh, and what we're doing for that purpose is we're defining this thing we call mapping layers, which is basically a coordinate system. Okay, we know what places we're talking about. We then have weighing factors that allow us to decide where to go, and then how to get there. Uh, in particular, we want to, going to have uh, collaboration. Okay, mapping layers. Here's the structure that we're developing. So let this be the potential standardization space for threshold schemes. As I mentioned, as a clear cut, single device on one side, multi-party on the other side, even though some techniques sometimes apply, for example, basic secret sharing is going to be used in both cases. Uh, and then we define this uh, concept that we're calling route. Imagine like track, track is already used. So um, route A is what we're calling simple thresholdization. So imagine something like um, RSA. There's very trivial ways of thresholdizing RSA, where basically there's a secret share of the, of the signing key, and then each, each agent, each party, basically does the equivalent to an RSA with using a subkey, and then in the end, they just multiply everything. So these are very simple. Uh, there may be very simple ways of thresholdizing cryptographic primitives that really don't, don't offer uh, much thought to it. On the other hand, then we have things like Route B, where, which we call compositional or complex designs, which would be things like, for example, making a threshold version of ECDSA that does not lend itself easily to, uh, to a multi-party computation, uh, except by using secure multi-party computation generic protocols. Same, for example, for multi-party AES. And then we also consider Route C, because we really want to keep at least the scope open, where would be things where we're actually even thresholdizing things that we don't even know yet if they're secure. Imagine things like thresholdizing post-quantum uh, primitives. Well, we're still in the process of evaluating if those schemes are good, so this is really far, uh, a little more far in the future. And then we also put this slightly different route D, which stands for gadgets or building blocks, whatever name you prefer, which would be things like uh, secret sharing, uh, oblivious transfer, commitment schemes, consensus, etc. Okay, this is a map. This doesn't mean that we want to go to all of these places. But, but these are the things that are within the scope of, uh, 
of threshold schemes. Okay, so just some conceived examples, just to really put some, uh, I mean, maybe to call some motivation for some people who really want to do this thing. So route A would be things like RSA decryption and signatures. Just use an homomorphic property and you have it very easily. Uh, Schnorr signature, some versions of it can be very easily thresholdized. Uh, key generation for elliptic curves, for example. And we also put here for the case of single device, what we would call a yes threshold circuit design using masking techniques. Uh, track B, uh, ECDSA signature, RSA key generation, a yes enciphering, multi-party version. And then for the single device case, there are more complicated cases that involve resilience against combined attacks. And then the case C, route C, the ones that I've already mentioned, and then route D, whatever primitive one may think is a building block. Okay, just a note, some of these items can actually be, some of these primitives can be in different uh, uh, routes because we, because there are different threshold versions that we can, that we may want to, to, to implement. And so that brings us to our final layer, which is what we call modes. Uh, and as a, an example, which, these are slightly generic examples, there may be a few others, but Imagine basically the interchangeable mode is the case where you want to do a threshold version of a, of a cryptographic primitive where the client does not, somebody who's asking a module to do a, 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 an operation does know that he's talking to a threshold scheme. So the interface needs to be exactly the same. The schemes need to be interchangeable. Then we have the secret shared input and or output where the client wants himself or herself to uh, uh, secret share the input maybe as a way of preserving privacy, let's say if he wants to pr preserve the privacy of the plain text that is being signed. Or we can have secret share sharing of the output if we want to have, let's say, privacy of an output of a decryption. Uh, and then we can also consider the, ca the auditable case, which would be, for example, a multi-signature where the client can actually prove that this was produced by a, by a threshold scheme. And that may allow, for example, that may have auditable, aud good auditable uh, properties. By the way, the slides will be available, so in some cases I will skip a little bit some text. Okay, what is the development process that we have uh, uh, in mind? Well, we're currently doing the roadmap. Um, once we have that, and all of these stages will include public feedback. Once we have that with public feedback, we intend to do calls with criteria. Then at some point we'll have evaluation of uh, contributions, and then at some point we'll, have is we'll issue standards. This is a generic uh, sequence of phases because, again, this can go differently for different items. In particular, uh, as I mentioned already a little bit, so different items can have um, different calls for contribution. So in some cases, we, we may ponder just putting a, a protocol out there and asking, do you think this is a good RSA threshold? Uh, algorithm, do you have any feedback to improve it? <clears throat> but in other cases, we may actually ask for new protocols. Uh, in other cases, let's say, for example, Route C, we may ask for uh, reference implementations that show feasibility and research results that show that those schemes are good. Uh, that will most likely lead to different timelines, namely across different routes. So what really what we want to do here is to keep our options open, but uh, identify that there are things that we can much likely uh, end in a, in a short span of time and others that would take a longer span of time. And then the actual final format of a standard can be very variable. So we can consider addendums to existing standards. Let's say you have a standard and now you just add a little section saying this is the threshold mode for this cryptographic primitive. Uh, in other cases, you may have a standalone standard or you can reference other standards we, we will also be looking for implementation and validation guidelines because that's also an important part of the process of having good standards. And then we can have what we can call reference definitions, which is, for example, maybe in many standards we will use secret sharing. Maybe at some point it might be useful to have a reference definition of what secret sharing is somewhere of some other, or some other gadgets. Um, just again to emphasize this point, public feedback is something that we really want, and uh, we're hoping that public feedback can indeed influence uh, the way uh, we can, well, the way that we will be taking, including for standardization items, for weighing factors, and for a number of features such as uh, should uh, should we have uh, schemes that allow dynamic thresholds? Should, what kind of security properties like composability and robustness should or can we have for certain schemes? Okay.
this is the update I wanted to give about threshold crypto. Now some considerations. Um, let me give a, what I'm calling a perspective on the granularity dilemma. So one of the things that has been coming over and over is this, well, it's actually two ideas. One is, um, and I, I kind of relate to this one because my, my background is in secure computation and usually when you have papers, we start with an ideal functionality and then we devise a protocol and then we prove it's secure. So one question would be, how about standardizing ideal functionalities? And then everybody's happy, everybody can propose their uh, protocols. Well, one of the problems is that that does not solve the, the process that we need to have, namely for some of our stakeholders, which is the process whereby vendors need to have validated implementations uh, to be able to use them, let's say, with the federal government. So basically, if we, if we standardize an ideal functionality and, you, and we stop there, that means now every time a vendor wants to sell their product, they're going to take it to, an, to, a, to a lab, that, uh, an accredit, accredited lab for certification, and now someone there who is probably not uh, a cryptographer is going to have to evaluate is this protocol secure or not. Um, so, okay, so should we go for concrete uh, protocols immediately? Well, but then we go for concrete protocols, maybe we're not achieving the ideal functionalities that everybody wants. So this is one of the dilemmas. The other dilemma is between building blocks. Should we start building blocks and then should we spend, let's say, two years uh, standardizing uh, very formally what two or three methods of secret sharing are and uh, uh, one oblivious transfer and two types of commitment schemes so that then people can build up on that with more two or three years or, or whatever? Or should we go immediately for complex constructions but then maybe we'll have a lot of redundant work? Well, the, the, the idea I want to advance, uh, maybe it's a little abstract, but I think it's an interesting idea, is that we don't really have to, well, first off, if we go on the middle point in any of this, we're basically also not solving any, any problem. So the idea that I want to put forward is that actually all of these areas have a place in the standardization uh, process. And unfortunately, I don't have enough time to kind of stay a few minutes in this slide, but just as an example, maybe we can relate it to threshold cryptography, although I think this is more general for other uh, uh, standardization goals as well. Imagine that actually what we want as a goal, at least for threshold cryptography, is to actually have a protocol that does threshold, uh, makes a threshold uh, mode of a cryptographic primitive. So we really want to have the protocol. But we want to get there by passing through the ideal functionality. So maybe, or uh, in some cases, you can uh, interpret ideal functionality as a, uh, a complete, uh, uh, um, sorry, a comprehensive set of security assertions and an interface, uh, just for cases where ideal functionalities might not uh, uh, be the right uh, version. So maybe this point could be in the point of, of defining criteria. So maybe when we want to define a threshold mode for a threshold scheme, maybe we can define an ideal functionality that could even be part of the feedback that we get from the public. And then when we ask for a call for contributions, we're actually asking, please show us protocols that satisfy this um, ideal functionality. And then uh, on this side, um, we want to have certain, we want to have concrete instantiations of building blocks, let's say commitment schemes. There are many ways in which we can do them, maybe hash base or Peterson commitments. Um, so we want to know how we do them in order to achieve this, but we don't necessarily have to define our initial goal of standardization to be a building block and have to wait to get to this point. Maybe it's enough initially to know what kind of building block we need and then when we define the, build, the actual protocol that we want, we know that we're going to have to instantiate this. Anyway, the diagram is left on the slides, we can, uh, left for more reflection. Um, another point, uh, standardization versus adoption. So what makes a standard good? Well, it should be a well done specification definitely, but it also depends on the context. So I would say a good standard should be a reference for, let's say, best practices and minimal defaults. For example, picking up again uh, with the threshold cryptography, if now we're providing a way in which uh, people can share their secret and not having in a, single, in a single place, if you have a key leakage from someone who was not using threshold crypto, then we can ask, well, maybe at that point, threshold crypto was a best practice. Why was this uh, company not using threshold crypto? Uh, a good standard would allow interoperability, would be suitable for validation and certification of implementations, and would be also a good reference to what to innovate upon. 
However, standards can also possibly be bad. For example, if in contexts where compliance is required, a standard would be bad if, if the techniques are obsolete or outdated. Uh, and for example, if we cannot verify and validate implementations that are actually prone to error. For example, if you need to use randomness, but there's no way of verifying if the randomness is good, and if the randomness is bad, then everything is broken, for example. Um, and standards can also be bad if the process does not allow for correction, withdrawal, or replacement of the standard when the standard should indeed be replaced. Okay, um, I'll move to speed 1.5. Uh, still try to cover uh, all the things I want to cover. Uh, another aspect that I think is relevant is the aspect of in intellectual property. It's often a, a delicate uh, um, aspect, but I think it's worth considering uh, explicitly. And what I want to say here is basically based on the NIST uh, Information Technology Lab uh, policy, which is a few things that I find are quite reasonable. First off is we can at least ask for disclosure of patents. I mean, it's nothing, it's, we're not saying good or bad about people having patents, but disclose them if you're being part of a process. In particular, we can call for disclosure at any time, including for people that don't have patents but know about other patents. And depending on the process, for example, if we have an open call for submissions, then we can actually put in some conditions, for example, conditions that the licensing, in case somebody has a patent, that at least makes a patent that is usually called friend, which would stand for fair, reasonable, and non-discriminatory. Uh, now, one uh, uh, point worth mentioning is that actually, let's say, for example, in the case of NIST, we can't force we can't force any third party to disclose that they have patents or that they will enable this kind of licensing terms. However, when we do uh, uh, guidance in standards, we can have our own condition, which is well, if at some point we we find that this is under a patent for somebody who's not going to license it in a fair, reasonable, and non-discriminatory terms, then we have the option of making that no longer a, a, a part of the guidance. I've included in the slides, not for, for the talk now, but uh, if, in case you want to consult some, of, some excerpts of the actual policy. Uh, another aspect, just as an example, is that I think it's useful with respect to the standardization processes to make transparent and to have a traceability of the evolution of documents to know why things were changed. This is one example of something within the threshold crypto, which was we had a draft report and then we basically compiled the PDF version where we had all the public comments and corresponding uh, uh, answers and then we had references to all the places in the text where changes were made. And I think that's quite useful with respect to, to traceability of changes. Okay, uh, privacy enhancing cryptography. It's really very brief, but just basically to claiming that we are in the arena. So we have this uh, PEC project, privacy enhancing project. The goal is to, so we're interested in privacy that can be promoted by cryptography. This includes techniques such as zero knowledge proofs and secure multi-party computations. And basically we want to keep up to date with the external initiatives. That's, that's a main goal. Uh, and an important goal in terms of, of, of um, output is to produce reference material, which does not have to be standards, but it will be material that will be useful for several purposes. It will allow us to assess the state of things at a, in a particular area, let's say, like zero knowledge proofs. It will uh, motivate applications and proofs of concepts in use cases. That's something that can actually promote that later in time this technology can be standardized. It may frame the further development of standards. Uh, that's something we consider important, basically, we can a long, a long time direct ourselves where to go. And it may, uh, reference material may by itself enable interoperability across, uh, uh, across people that actually want to use these technologies. Okay, so <clears throat> one, one example of something that we're doing currently is we're uh, interacting with ZK Proof, which is one of the standardization technologies that will be uh, that Daniel is organizing and that will be discussed also during this workshop. Uh, basically, ZK Proof is an effort towards standardization of zero knowledge proofs. It's an open initiative of uh, industry and academia. And one of the things that it does is produces open documentation. And this fits our reference material approach. So uh, what we've been doing is that we were asked by ZK Proof earlier this year for feedback on their documentation and we decided to engage with them. So basically, uh, a few things that we did, we ported the initial documentation into LaTeX, we, pro we, we provided some comments, and then we proposed an editorial process to develop the documentation into a community reference. 
then based on that, we also participated in the second workshop and we're now also in the process of producing contributions with the rest of the community. So in summary, uh, this is one activity, one example of an activity that supports advanced cryptographic standardization, where we're not necessarily saying we're doing a standard on this right away, but we're collaborating with that initiative. Uh, and just still within the, the realm of PEC, we, are, we also want to promote, promote uh, secure multi-party computation, but no time in this presentation for that, but hopefully in the future, soon future, we'll have things to talk about. Okay, concluding remarks. Um, Okay, the title contains advanced cryptography, but we didn't really talk about what is advanced cryptography. I'm just gonna leave it as a question, or as a number of questions. So what is it that makes, what is it, that makes it advanced, at least regarding standardization? Is it that we have uh, a lot of times protocols, let's say with distributed systems within it, instead of a single, uh, single side primitive, where somebody's just doing, let's say, a signature? Is it because we have many paradigms and options to choose from? Is it because we're using complex techniques that were not previously standardized? That may also be a case, uh, at least, for example, in the case of secure multi-party computation, certainly. Um, or is it simply because we have an uncertainty of, of what path we should, uh, we should take? Well, I'm not gonna give an answer, but just make two notes, which is, well, first off, what is advanced today can be basic tomorrow. So we never know what advanced is. And um, one point that I think, uh, I mean, it's, I think it's really interesting to reflect about this. Maybe we actually also need more advanced uh, standardization processes. And this might be what we need to tackle, advanced cryptography standardization. Okay, so just to have a call for collaboration here in these conclusions, um, we want to collaborate with open and transparent processes towards standardization of advanced cryptography. So please do let us know if you want to collaborate with NIST in any of the initiatives that we are uh, driving or any of the initiatives that we are collaborating with other people that are taking the lead. Um, just two more concluding slides. So this one with concluding remarks, just a number of items. So uh, just a statement. NIST is interested in the development of advanced cryptography. And this includes secure implementations, technology adoption, interoperability, standards, reference material, etc. Uh, the standard development process matters. So it's not just the final standard, whatever preconceived vision we may have of it, but we really feel that, especially for advanced cryptography, we are exploring and we are learning with the process, learning by doing. Uh, not everything should be standardized by NIST. Some things should, but not everything. Uh, still, that's not an impediment that we can collaborate with those things. Uh, Sets of final standards can be of several types, can be what we typically envision as a standard, but again, can be other things, can be reference definitions, can be addendums in some documents. Uh, the standard, standardization considerations go beyond technical security, involve trust, for example, um, and involve a lot of things within uh, uh, the process. Another one that I guess sometimes is relegated, humans are part of the equation, so we don't have infinite resources, and so collaboration inter-stakeholders is uh, essential. And just also as a final statement, NIST is currently active in threshold crypto and uh, privacy-enhancing cryptographies. And just to finalize with a question, uh, which of today's developing standards will remain, let's say 70 years from now, as building blocks of advanced crypto? And the reason why I chose 70 years is just because I wanna show a cool picture which is from NIST. This is actually a wall that exists in NIST. It's called the NIST Stone Test Wall. It was built 71 years ago to study the performance of stone subjected to weathering. And so you have here the photo in 1948. It still stands, but actually if you go close by, you'll see that little, little stones are actually quite eroded and others are still standing firm. Um, but actually I think it's a, a cool question to ask, like what, what will be crypto in 70 years and are we, are we looking towards developing standards that will be, uh, that will have good durability or, I mean, it's difficult to answer, of course. And uh, thank you very much for your attention. Perfect. Thank you, Luis. And uh, mine is not a question, just a comment. Uh, from the perspective of the steering committee of the ZK Proof Standardization Effort, I would like to strongly commend NIST and Luis personally for their involvement in our effort. 
Um, they've been extremely invaluable in, um, in bringing their uh, hard-earned hard lessons about standardization and uh, what matters and how to do it properly. And uh, it's uh, unusual and very encouraging to see them nurturing things from such an early stage towards eventual standards. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you.